conditions that made this night possible. I'm running for Congress because Washington is broken and we have no choice but to fix it. We need problem solvers who will be Kansans long before they're Democrats and Republicans. I have a proven record of working with people from all political stripes to get things done for Kansans. That's why I'm endorsed by almost 40 current and former Republican elected officials. People like Senator Tim Emmert, former State Board of Education member Val Beaver from right here in Independence. We have to send people to Washington who are willing to work with the other political party, who know how to get things done, and who are willing to buck their own party from time to time, which is one of the reasons why I won't support Nancy Pelosi. This campaign is about you. It's about your children. It's about your grandchildren. It's about our communities. I've been in every nook and cranny of the second district. I've heard your concerns. I've heard your stories. And I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work for you. Thank you. All right, the first question tonight deals with health care. The question is how will you work in Congress to improve access to health care, specifically rural health care? And I'm going to end will be alternating, so we'll see. I mean, uh, Paul, you'll start this time. The issue of health care is a very personal issue to me. My dad passed away earlier this year. He had Parkinson's disease, and as a result of that, he had to take many, many medica medications. One of those medications cost over $1,000 a month, and I had to have that kitchen table discussion with my parents about how it was that they were gonna be able to afford that. That's a discussion that far too many American families are having right now. You can't talk about access to health care without addressing the issue of cost. The biggest driver of cost out there is prescription drugs. The top 10 publicly traded drug companies made over $67 billion in profits last year. They're running Washington, D.C. right now. What we need to do is, is we need to let Medicare directly negotiate with the drug companies. We need patent reform. We need to direct the FDA to speed up the approval of generics, and we need to be allowed to import prescription drugs from countries that have proven safety records. We need to preserve what we like about the Affordable Care Act, and we need to fix what we don't like about the Affordable Care Act. And we need to protect our rural hospitals. Those of you who live here in Montgomery County and Independence know this issue better than anybody else, and now the people in Fort Scott and Bourbon County are having to deal with it. What we need to do is, is we need to roll back the cuts to Medicare reimbursements that have really hurt hospitals. We need to expand telemedicine. We need to expand Medicaid. And for our veterans, we need to promote Veterans Choice programs and help the VA get more active in rural areas. Right now, Washington, D.C. is playing politics with your health care day in and day out, and it has to stop. All right, Steve. My, uh, my father is a physician, and so is my wife. My wife is actually a uh, GYA oncology surgeon. That's a service not, to the best of my knowledge, not currently provided uh, in Northeast Kansas or even anywhere in the district. And so we're talking about somebody who's dedicated their life to women's health. I'm proud of her, and, uh, and she's my best friend. So healthcare issues are a particular concern of ours. It's something we've talked about around the kitchen table my whole life. And it, whenever you've got a large set of systems, whatever metric you're looking at, uh, whatever metric that you're looking for, be it lower price, uh, better competition, um, safer work environment, uh, more innovation, uh, it's best to build those systems on a platform of capitalism, characterized by transparency, and competition, and empowering physicians. Because right now I've heard it firsthand, my, my wife and my father, other physicians, are straddled by unnecessary and burdensome regulations. You know, and that's not the, the Democratic answer, is this Pelosi's Obamacare, which is basically the opposite. I mean, we know this shtick, the Medicare for all shtick, that will cost taxpayers $32 trillion. I mean, it, that would cause the result in the largest tax hike in modern American history. And that's, that's a little solution to this. I, call, I, I say, let's go in the other direction, Let's strip down the unnecessary and burdensome regulations. Let's empower the physicians who know best. 
and uh, let's provide people with innovative problem-solving solutions. I've talked with uh, Dr. Ryan New of Lawrence, Dr. Vance Lassie of Holton. These are direct primary care physicians who have built their practices in a, using an innovative capitalist model, and they're providing world-class service to hundreds and hundreds of patients in their communities. Um, also, we are proud to have uh, the University of Kansas Center for Telemedicine and uh, Telehealthcare providing innovative problem-solving solutions to rural America. So, thank you. One introduction I overlooked, Mary Jane Chang from East End from oh. She's our crime keeper tonight. Apologize for that. And I've noticed that uh, she's doing a good job and, and they're doing a good job of following her, so that's great. All right, third question, and it'll be addressed then, I'm sorry, the second question will be addressed to Steve first, and it uh, involves Social Security. Kansas has many citizens who depend on the monthly Social Security income. We have heard that Social Security cuts have been considered by the current Congress and the future cuts are a possibility. As a congressman, how will you approach this important issue for Kansas? A promise made is a promise kept. We made a promise to those at or approaching retirement age, and we need to keep that promise. We won't break it, not on my watch. Okay? That's not an entitlement for you. That's what we owe you because you paid into a system and it's yours to withdraw. Now, the system is broke. The bad news is Social Security is broken. And even if it wasn't, it couldn't cover the cost of a decent retirement. You see, it was established in 1935, where the uh, average life expectancy was 60 years old. Right? And, uh, and you couldn't even draw retirement Social Security until 65. Well, now the average life expectancy is 79. Now people are drawing Social Security for 10, 20, 30 years, and that's fine, but the system is broke. And so moving forward, I mean, even, even the, the Board of Trustees of Social Security said it will be bankrupt in 20 years. We've got a broken system, and that's, that's what we can expect from the liberals. They create these large, robust systems in our, that are simply not governed well. So my plan is twofold. We, uh, we protect the, uh, the Social Security for those at and approaching retirement age. And in addition, my generation, Generation X, moving forward, we've got to take a close, hard look at the program and realize that it is going bankrupt. So my advice is to the people my age and less is don't expect those types of benefits, not at the rate that we're currently receiving them. So uh, again, if you're young, budget, avoid debt, and invest. If you're old, we will, we will stay true to our promise. <coughs> All right, thank you, Paul. If Social Security is a, a commitment uh, that has been made to the American people, the contract that our government has entered into uh, with us. Uh, we pay into that system and we count on it being there for us. There are 66 million Americans uh, who are Social Security beneficiaries right now. 45 million of those are senior citizens. One of those 45 million is my mom. And she depends on Social Security every month uh, to be able to make ends meet. Many people, that is their only source of income is Social Security. And in here in Eastern Kansas, uh, you know, we don't have a ton of wealthy folks, uh, really wealthy folks out there. And so preserving and protecting Social Security is an even more important issue right here in Eastern Kansas than it is, I think, just about anywhere in America right now. Now, what's going on in Congress, frankly, is disturbing. Recently, House Republicans announced a plan to cut Social Security benefits by $14 trillion. That is a tremendous amount of money. Not $14 million, not $14 billion, but $14 trillion. I think that that is wrong. Now, there's some people out there that are talking about how we ought to expand benefits, and it would be nice if we could have that discussion. But the fact of the matter is, is we need to be focusing on preserving the current benefits that we have. And if we're going to do that, the federal government has to get its fiscal house in order. We're seeing exploding deficits and exploding debt. And the recent tax plan has made things just that much worse. In fact, it has triggered a $25 billion cut to Medicare, another commitment that we have made to America's seniors. I will make this commitment to you. I will not vote to cut Social Security pay for tax cuts, I will not vote to, protect, to cut Social Security to, to balance our budget. It's simply wrong and it violates the commitment we've made to American seniors. All right, 
right, the third question involves education. And again, Paul will be your turn to go first. The Kansas State Board of Education has developed the Kansas CAN School Redesign Program to redesign public education in Kansas around the needs of each individual Kansas student. Are you familiar with the Kansas CAN vision, and how can you, as a member of Congress, support this vision and bring this uh, vision to Congress? I am familiar with Kansas CAN. The Kansas CAN is a good thing. It moves us away from this one-size-fits-all model to where we can individualize a plan for how we're going to deliver a great quality education to a Kansas child. The issue of education is dear and dear to me. I am the son of two teachers. Uh, my wife Stephanie and I are the parents of a third grader in public school. She attends the school that I went to as a great schooler and the school that my mom taught at for over 20 years. Education in many ways has been uh, the cause of my life uh, in public service. And I'm reminded of that every day when I drop Caroline off at school. I believe in local control though. And sometimes in the area of education, the best thing that the federal government can do is just get out of the way. But uh, there are some things the federal government can do to help make Kansas can a success. The best dollars that we invest are dollars that we invest in early childhood education. I'm a very strong supporter of the Head Start program. And there are many places here in our state where they are achieving wonderful, wonderful outcomes. Uh, places like the Jerry Ham Early Learning Center in Coffeyville. We also need to continue to invest in IDEA. IDEA provides special education funds. It's a commitment that was made by the federal government back in the 1970s that they just have not fulfilled. And if we continue to invest in IDEA, it will help every single school district all across the state. What we do not need more of is unfunded mandates from the federal government. You know, the No Child Left Behind was a laudable goal, but it was an unfunded mandate. I'm endorsed by teachers, and I will continue to make education a very top priority of elected to the United States Congress. Steve? My mother is a teacher. My dad's dad is a teacher, and so is my little sister. It's a family profession. And uh, I'm not going to ask a show of hands, but if there are any teachers here, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you do for our communities. Thank you for what you do for our children. You uh, shape the minds that will be solving the problems of tomorrow. And what you do there it seems more important than what I do. So thank you. I mean that very sincerely. And uh, it's, it's fitting that the uh, State Board of edu edu Education calls its redesign program Kansans Can, Kansas Can. See, my campaign motto is Kansans Can Do Anything. Maybe you've seen it uh, on the signs or the boards. And I, I believe that empowering message, I believe that that's exactly what we need to instill within our kids. I think we need to give them the courage and the wisdom to solve the problems of tomorrow. And who, who's better at that? teachers or bureaucrats in Washington. Because if the liberal uh, education solution is to, get, is to lateral that uh, responsibility off to bureaucrats, well, I think the teachers are best empowered to do that. I think the teachers and the, student, uh, and the parents are best positioned to craft the education to develop our children. So uh, again, thank you to all the teachers out there. And uh, I assure you, I will fight for you, not the bureaucrats in Washington. All right, the next question involves our workforce. A majority of businesses in the United States agree that the number one challenge facing business today is the lack of skilled and reliable workforce. How do we ensure that the U.S. workforce is trained and ready to meet the demands of American businesses? Steve Goldberg. We need to encourage and empower everyone to find their way in this life. And uh, sometimes that means a four-year educational degree. Sometimes it means a vocational technical school. I met somebody on the campaign trail, Larry. He, uh, he went to a state school and got a four-year degree in history. Well, that's great. And he had a few jobs that uh, none of them seemed to click. None of them seemed to fit. And so he went back to a tech school and became a certified maintenance supervisor. He was telling me about his job, he was telling me about uh, what he did, who he did it for, and, 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 and the passion that you, you sensed in him was, it was inspiring. It was clear to him that the best fit for Larry was to become a certified maintenance supervisor. 
And uh, we need to keep those options available to young professionals, people to, who were looking to come out of high school and challenge themselves in different ways. I knew I wanted to uh, go into the Army. And my mom and dad said, well, we'd encourage you to go to college. I said, well, I want to go into the Army. And they said, we, we prefer that you find your way for more, more academics. I said, okay. And so I, we found an equal ground on which West Point Military Academy and studied engineering. We, the idea here is that we need to empower and ensure that all people, young and not so young, have the academic options to become the best version of themselves. Thank you. Veterans Affairs. You know, I know the issues firsthand. I've been a payroll for almost 20 years. I've been a member of my local chamber of commerce for about the same time. And I've been there trying to find skilled workers uh, to be, they can do the job. And as I talk to people in the business community, you just hear this uh, over and over and over again. We have a changing economy right now. Uh, the challenges that have been presented by automation and by the changes of, in the retail sector are very significant. I think the best thing that we can do is to invest in proven workforce training programs, whether those are at K through 12 schools, whether they're at technical colleges like Washburn Tech and Topeka, or whether they're at community colleges like Independence Community College and Coffeyville Community College, or whether they're with labor union apprentice programs. One of the things that I am proud to have done in the state legislature is to support a very significant investment in workforce training programs. Uh, I'm not one to heap a lot of praise on Governor Brownback, but I think that was one of the best things that, that he did when he was governor, and it's uh, proven to be a great success. I was at Neosho County Community College a number of months ago. Right now, a graduate of Neosho County Community College makes more money right out of school than a graduate from KU or K-State. It's an amazing statistic. The president there said, we need to expand the Pell Grant program so that more people can take advantage of those opportunities. A number of weeks ago, I was at Independence Community College, the Fab Lab. The entrepreneurs of tomorrow are being molded at the Fab Lab in Independence. You know, the, the next great business in Kansas is not coming from a boardroom in Chicago or Los Angeles. Uh, it's coming from a place like the Fab Lab, and that's why we've got to continue to invest in proven workforce training programs like that. Now we're ready for Veterans Affairs, and Paul, it'll be your turn to go first again. Today, veterans face a range of issues upon completing the true of service, from healthcare issues to workforce reintegration. How will you address these critical issues facing our current and future veterans? We owe our veterans a debt of gratitude that, frankly, uh, we'll never be able to pay. Steve is a veteran, and uh, while if we were allowed to, we would probably be up here disagreeing on some things, uh, but I'm very grateful for his service. Uh, my wife, Stephanie, is here tonight and has spent her entire career helping veterans. She's a psychologist and serves as the suicide prevention coordinator for the Eastern Kansas VA. I told people that uh, if I'm elected to Congress, I will in no way have the hardest job in the Davis household. Uh, that belongs to Stephanie. But she'll be the first one to tell you that the VA's got a lot of problems. It's unacceptable that veterans are having to wait sometimes days, weeks, months to be able to receive the health care that they need. I think the Veterans Choice Program is a huge step in the right direction. You know, if there's a veteran that lives in Coffeyville and needs to have his gallbladder removed, shouldn't have to go to the VA in Wichita or Topeka to have that done. They can get that done right at Coffeyville Regional Medical Center. But at the same time, the VA needs to be more present in rural areas. Uh, the VA ought to be going to veterans instead of requiring veterans to come to them. Veterans also have a lot of challenges as they are reintegrating into the workforce. One of the things that I did when I was in the state legislature is, is I offered a bill that became law that gave veterans in-state tuition at Kansas universities and community colleges. It gives them the opportunity to get the education and the skills that they need to find that next career. You know, I think veterans uh, are all over this district. We have a big veteran population. We have a major military installation. We have two 
VAs, and we have to have a member of Congress uh, who I think is going to be a leader for veterans and is going to be constantly reminding all of us of the commitment that these, our veterans have made to us and how we need to honor them back. All right, Steve. Thank you. Uh, veterans, this is, this is me. This is my life. These are the lives of my, uh, my soldiers, my friends. I spent 10 years in the Army. I spent four years at West Point and six years in the regular Army. I um, fought in Afghanistan, and, um, and now I'm a patient of the Veterans Administration. I've been to many um, in this country. The vast majority of my experiences have been very positive. Some of them have not. Um, Sometimes it's pretty bad, and we as veterans sitting there will say things like, deny, deny, until they die. <coughs> deny, deny, until they die. We say that when we hear tales of schedulers selecting dates for doctor's appointments, knowing that the dates won't work, uh, making veterans wait longer if they complain, I'm not okay with that, and um, I'll work tirelessly to stop that. Thank you. You know what, I think I got time. Uh, you know, there are 22 veterans commit suicide each day. That's not okay. And I'm not gonna propose that any of us can disagree with that. And so um, let's agree that together we need to get that number down to zero. All right, free trade. What is your stance on the current tariffs and their effect on agriculture, manufacturing, and other commercial industries? And Steve, you'll be going first. Sure, you know, I call balls and strikes on Donald Trump. I mean, there's a lot of things that I like. I like how the uh, economy's clipping off at a good rate. I like record low unemployment, uh, particularly among minorities. Um, I like low regulations, I like low taxes. I like being tough on the uh, international front, particularly with regards to North Korea, but there are areas where we disagree. One of those has to do with trade. I'm a free trade guy, and if it's going to be a temporary measure amount that we use to, to achieve a greater end, then, well, I guess we can discuss how patient we'll be. And that's, that's what I get when I talk with our growers and when I talk with our manufacturers. They, they get it, but, uh, but I'm a free trade guy. You know, it, and, and, and when we talk about, you know, trade as a larger component of our economic structure and our economic system, I'm a capitalist. And the reason that's so relevant is uh, some 45% of young people view capitalism as negative. What, and, and most of those are, if not all, are left of center. 51 feel positive about socialism. 69 would be willing to vote for a socialist. And this is, of course, when the government owns the means of production. Capitalism has helped lift over a billion people out of poverty. It's perhaps the greatest force of good that I can think of outside of religion. It's certainly the greatest uh, economic structure the world has ever known. And so, you know, the, these, these new uh, liberals, Maxine Waters, Bernie Sanders, Nancy Pelosi, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, these are card-carrying members of the Socialist Party that has brought more grief in this world than you could possibly imagine or we can possibly measure. It's not okay just to print, free, print out money. It decreases the value of all of ours, our individual bills. So I'm a capitalist, I'm a free trade guy. All right, Paul. This is a huge issue for Kansas. You know, agriculture is the backbone of our economy. I was in Iola a number of months ago and hosting a community roundtable. There was a woman there from one of the local banks. She specializes in egg loans. She got very emotional when we started talking about tariffs. She said to me, I'm laying awake at night worrying about my customers because they're struggling right now. Farm incomes are at a 12 year low. We don't have a farm bill that's going to deliver some stability for farmers, and now the tariffs are hurting farmers all across our state. I was reminded of this as I was standing in a soybean field a few weeks ago with a farmer, 
I'm looking at those rows of soybeans. One out of every three of those rows gets exported to China. So when the Chinese slap a tariff on soybeans, the price per bushel plummets, every farmer is going to feel that. We need free trade. We make more than what we consume here in the United States, and we have to be able to move those products to markets all across the globe. And we feed the world right here in Kansas. And this doesn't affect just agriculture. Uh, when I was here in Independence a number of months ago, uh, we had a business roundtable, and one of the gentlemen there was with MGD, Pro uh, MGD Products in Coffeeville and went to his facility afterwards. Uh, they make steel plate fabrication products, and steel tariffs have hit them in a big way. And I think this is an issue where, frankly, we need to come together as Kansans. It's not a Democrat or a Republican issue. We need to come together as Kansans, and we need to, we need to say to the president, this is not working. And it's hurting our communities. It's damaging our communities. And I'm going to be a strong voice for that in Washington. All right, Paul, you go first on the next question that deals with the area of transportation and infrastructure. How would you support the rebuilding of the infrastructure system across the United States from transportation to utility? We badly need an infrastructure package uh, for America. I've been talking to a number of mayors across the second district here recently. I was on the phone with the mayor of Columbus the other day and asking him, you know, what's going on in your community? And he said, we have tremendous infrastructure needs and we simply do not have the resources uh, to be able to meet those needs. Uh, this is an issue that I've been involved with for a long time. I was one of the key people that got our state transportation plan passed back in 2010. We built the bipartisan coalition and worked with Governor Parkinson to get it passed. Unfortunately, that plan did not come to fruition because Governor Brownback basically siphoned most of the money away from it to pay for his tax experiment. But this is a this is an issue that President Trump says is a priority for him, and I think it is should be a priority for America. I think it's a great example of an issue that Democrats and Republicans can work together on in Washington and do some good things for America. It will create jobs. It will protect our roads and bridges. It will enhance safety. And what I hope we will also do is, is we will include rural broadband in an infrastructure package. Now, I, I was in Donovan County talking to a bunch of farmers, and they were telling me about how they're trying to run their irrigation system off of a hot spot. Some of you in this audience probably know what that's like. That's a hard thing to do. And we need to have rural broadband sets so that we can help our farmers, we can help help them grow what they're doing and help create more jobs here in Southeast Kansas. All right, Steve. Yeah. So I'm an engineer, um, degree in engineering from West Point. I, I, uh, I'm a builder. I have a master's in real estate development from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology from MIT. I, uh, I know O&M. I've been on O&M projects. I've helped oversee its operations and maintenance. And the U.S. is not really doing very good on this front. And it's not because we don't have money. We've got a lot. We don't have the systems in place because we don't have enough knowledge in Congress, knowledge uh, knowledge base like mine. You see, according to the DOT, there are 14,000 deaths per year tied to poor road conditions. 14,000. That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, the World Economic Forum ranks us 16th in infrastructure, and I know I've been to about 75 countries, and I, when I go to China, I can't help but to feel competitive. And when I go to the UAE and Dubai, I can't help but to feel competitive. When I'm looking at theirs, I don't want to be 16th. I want to be first, and we need a Congress that understands that. We need another Congress that understands that it's not okay that 14,000 people die because of our poor road conditions. 65% of our roads are less than good. One quarter of our bridges need repair. The civil, uh, uh, civil engineers give us a D plus. And, uh, and so I, I love that Trump is getting behind a big infrastructure bill. You know, we need to work hard on how to pay that, pay for that exactly. You know, but uh, it, it's important, not only it, it's a bipartisan effort, but it also, uh, and it will also save us money in the long run. If you aggregate up, you add up all the, uh, the money saved from the depreciation of the wear and tear of our systems and our vehicles, 
you know, the, the value added is a net positive. So these prices are high, but I'm a builder, I know, and it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Can't talk enough about infrastructure. <laughs> Especially in Southeast Kansas. Next question then will be addressed to Steve Starfield, and that covers immigration. How would you address immigration, immigration and its accompanying humanitarian issues, especially in the scope of workforce challenges industries like agricultural face in rural areas of the United States? First, I'm a build the wall guy, and that doesn't make us mean spirited or the racist bigots that some leftists would have you believe. It just means we're, it's just common sense. We've got a very generous country, and when you throw open the borders, more people are going to want to come out and leave. I've lived in, in countries where the entire country would come if they could. That both inspires me and makes me proud, but it also kind of scares me especially since the liberals just seem to want to be okay with the poorest border. So, you know, it, I, I, I've helped plan for design and overseen walls. They're not, they're, in the battle space, they're not even a debated issue. They're not even a legal tool that we use. We can't use them, what's next? We can't use a pickup truck. I mean, so I'm a build the wall guy, but we also <laughs> need to give our, our growers, our farmers, our manufacturers, the HR they need in order to produce. So that means a, uh, a usable and a workable uh, visa program that, uh, that makes sense. I was just meeting with dairy producers today. The visa program doesn't work for them. Seems like an easy fix. I'm hoping that we can go to that, go at that in a bipartisan manner. So I'm proud of our country. I want to keep our culture that doesn't make us Republicans bad. It makes us, it's just, it, makes, it, makes, it makes common sense. So I'm going to build the wall in sanctuary cities, in chain migration, Give growers and builders and, and manufacturers their HR that they need, and uh, but also respect the fact that we are a nation of immigrants. I'm so proud of that. I got a couple of my staffers here who are immigrants. My wife is an immigrant. We're all descendants of immigrants. Let's let's keep that in mind and approach the issues of immigration with uh, with compassion and uh, and realism. Thank you. All right, Paul. Well, the most important role of the federal government is to keep us safe, to protect us. Our immigration system right now is a mess. When I was in the state legislature, we were forced to deal with a variety of immigration issues, and every time that we had to deal with that, I would always say, why is it that Congress just can't seem to get anything done here? Because these issues really, in many ways, have to be solved at the federal level. It's because we just have way too much partisan bickering that is going on in Washington, D.C. There's no doubt that we have too many people that are coming over the border uh, with Mexico, and we've got to secure our border. We need more resources for border security. I think we need to listen to the experts on border security as to how we best accomplish that. Uh, I support ICE. You know, ICE plays a critical role in combating human trafficking, which is unfortunately a problem that we know far too much about here in Kansas. We need to address the DREAMers and DACA. There's bipartisan support for both of those. Uh, we need to make sure that children are not separated from their parents. And we need to ensure that our farmers and people working in agriculture have the workforce that they need in order to get the job done. We are a nation of immigrants. My ancestors came here from Ireland and Germany and Scotland, and all of us have a different story. And I believe that people who are here that are contributing to our economy, that are playing by the rules, that are paying taxes, that are learning English, should be given a pathway to becoming an American citizen. George W. Bush proposed this when he was president. And unfortunately, because we had too much bickering in Congress, we just couldn't get it done. If we're going to finally get something done, we have to send problem solvers to Congress who know how to get things done. The last of the prepared questions. Lobbying and special interest groups. And this time, Paul, you'll be going first. How will your office address the increasing influence by lobbyists and special interest groups? You know, right now, we have a Congress that really doesn't work for us. It should be working for us. 
but it works for the special interests and it works for the people who fund their political campaigns. I think the biggest problem that we have in politics right now is just the excessive amount of money. When I was in the state legislature, I championed many campaign finance reforms so we, that we could get a handle on this. And we were able to get some bills passed so that we now know more about who's funding campaigns and who are the people that are trying to affect your vote. We've seen a lot of big money that's come in uh, to this race. And it's just frankly disgusting to see how much money that we have in politics. You know, this is our democracy. It belongs to us. It shouldn't belong to billionaires in Las Vegas who write $30 million checks to try to have an impact on our election year. We ought to be the ones who are doing that. That's why I believe that we need to overturn the Citizens United decision that has brought hundreds of millions of dollars into our political campaigns. We need to get rid of the partisan gerrymandering that has made Congress dysfunctional. And we need to end this revolving door of people who go to Washington, D.C. in Congress, they become lobbyists, and then many of them go on to work in the administration in positions where they are directly regulating the industry that they used to lobby for. That ought to be banned. I'm going to be a very, very strong voice for campaign finance reform uh, because we've got to get our democracy back again. Democracy should not be for sale to the highest bidder because it belongs to us. One of the reasons I'm running is to keep career politicians and lobbyists out of office. There's so much money in politics, it's hard to fathom that. You see, I mean, this race, so much money is coming in, and you know, it's inconsistent with the Founding Fathers' intent with our country. You see, it was their vision that actually the state legislators would have more uh, more authority, more power than the federal government. They didn't work they were throwing around ideas of not even uh, paying these these congressmen because they that's that that's that they, they, they weren't going to be as powerful as they've grown. Now there's so much money in Washington and uh, some of the some of the wealthiest counties that we have are in and around the Beltway. Again that's that that's uh, inconsistent with the founding fathers and ten great addition would be uh, bipartisan legislation to assure that we've got transparency so we know where this money is coming from and we know where it's going. So uh, I look forward to working with anybody to, uh, to lower the influence of big money spenders and special interests on Capitol Hill. All right, that concludes the question portion. We would have had more questions, but we anticipated it would take a little longer, but unfortunately Mr. Tan wasn't here, so that, that shortened it considerably. At this time, the candidates will address you. You'll have five minutes to make a concluding statement. And we'll start with Steve and then Paul. Right. I'll go ahead and do it over there. Thank you again so much, Fred and Joe, and uh, the bureaus, the chambers. It's been a real honor to continue on our discussions. I want people to feel Empowered that they uh, they know the difference between the two candidates. You know, I um, was born on an Air Force base in Texas, and my first memories were in Washington D.C. The monuments and the memorials, Dad in his uniform, patriotism is a family value in the Watkins household, and that's one of the reasons why I joined the military as young as I legally could, and. Uh, I chose to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point because we also valued academics. And I chose Alaska as a duty station because I'm an outdoorsman at heart and I got into dog sled racing and mountaineering. After 9-11, I was scheduled to get out of the military, but I voluntarily extended so that I could deploy to Afghanistan to serve in support of the 10th Mountain Division. And that was the first time I saw combat and I knew that was the shape my patriotism took. So when I got out of the military, I uh, went to Iraq to help start and grow a engineering and security outfit. Grew from, helped grow up from three people to 470 people operating in two war zones. And these values, these, these heartland values as I describe them, the low government, low tax, minimal government, low taxes, low regulation, religious freedom, family values, patriotism, peace through military strength. 
the rule of law, the Second Amendment, pro-life, these values underpin an idea, an idea that was born in 1776 to an imperfect crew of Western revolutionaries. So my vision for the Republic is, is, is the latest version of our founding fathers and him for our country. The our founding fathers wouldn't have called those values Republican values. They would have called them American values. So my goal is to help preserve that republic, to help safeguard our culture and defend our country. And many years ago, I raised my right hand and made a promise to do just that. That led me all over the world, led me into moments and situations that were very intense. Leading up to those moments, oftentimes I'd have to talk with an individual, young boy sometimes, and instill the kind of courage that it would take to go out onto the street with guns, out onto the street where other men and women have died. So what do you tell them? What do you tell them? To elicit that kind of courage, that selflessness, I say, listen, you gotta go where it's hard to accomplish what's great. You know, in all those years of war, I really only learned a couple of things. I learned that there are horrible and evil men in this world. And I learned that in order, and you have to act, learn that you have to fight them. You have to rise up and master those moments. You have to go out into the street with guns, and you can't say go. You have to say follow me. You gotta do what's hard in order to accomplish what is great. So my journey has led me to here, led me to this race. It's led me to offer what I can. My hard work, my sacrifice, my ear, my best version of myself, and so that we can help lead this Kansas Second District into the future. So thank you very much for your attention tonight. I appreciate it. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you, Steve. Paul, you want to come up here, too? Microphone adjustment here. Well, thank you to all of you for uh, coming out to join us uh, here tonight. You know, the title of the job that we are auditioning for is representative. I think it's uh, important for us to remember that in order to represent somebody, you have to know them. You have to know what their concerns are, what they really care about. I started this campaign with a listening tour of all 25 counties, and I heard your concerns. I heard that Washington just doesn't seem to be listening to you anymore. You're wondering whether Washington even cares about you anymore. I heard about your concerns about tariffs, about health care, about the economy. You know, just here in Independence, I've been to the community college and heard about the great things going on with Fab Lab. I heard from business leaders at our round table about the concerns they had about tariffs. I've been to Labette Health's new facility here. I've been to Fort County Mental Health and heard about the challenges that they deal with day in and day out, helping people with mental health needs. And I've listened to dozens and dozens of people. I've done that in community after community after community. And the agenda that I really have built in this campaign comes from those discussions. My agenda in Congress is really your agenda. It's an agenda about lowering health care costs. It's about saying to the drug companies, enough is enough. You can't raise our prescription drug costs year after year after year by double digits. We have to fix the Affordable Care Act. Let's preserve what we like about it, and let's fix what we don't like. What we can't do is go back to an era, though, where insurance companies can discriminate against us because we have cancer or we have diabetes. We can't go back to an era where 25-year-olds can't stay on their parents' policy anymore. And we have to protect our rural hospitals. You here in Independence know this better than anybody else. We have some great hospitals. I've been to almost every hospital in the second district. But 
there are many of them are struggling right now, and they need some help from the federal government. We have an economy right now that is working pretty well if you're well off, but it's not working very well for middle income and lower income Kansans. You look at this tax bill that recently passed Congress. 83% of the benefits of that bill go to people who make over $900,000 a year. I don't know how many people you know that make over $900,000 a year. I'm not sure that I know anybody. During this discussion, I offered my own plan. I said, we can find $90 billion of tax savings by closing loopholes that need to be closed, and we ought to return that money to middle income and lower income Kansans, all of it to them. We need a farm bill so farmers can have some stability for the future. We need an infrastructure package so that we can help rebuild America. We need rural broadband so that we can create more jobs here in Southeast Kansas. And we need immigration reform so that we can secure our borders. But in order to accomplish all of these things, we need to take on the corruption of Washington, D.C. We've got to get rid of the dark money. We've got to end the partisan gerrymandering. We've got to close the revolving door of lobbyists. I'm the son of two teachers. I've lived in Kansas since I was 10 days old. My wife and I have made our home here. We're raising our daughter here. People say to me, if you get elected to Congress, are you moving to Washington? Absolutely not. I'm hoping that we can create a Kansas future for our daughter so that she will stay here. I've been a member of my local chamber of commerce for over 20 years. I'm endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police. I spent 12 years working with Republicans to get things done in the state legislature. It's one of the reasons why I'm endorsed by all of those Republican leaders. I've cut tax, I've voted to cut taxes 150 times. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work for you in Congress and to change how Washington is behaving so that we can get a Congress that works for us again instead of a Congress that works for the special interest. Thank you, and I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thanks very much to both Steve Washington and Paul Davis, and now it would be appropriate to express your appreciation for their being here.